few months ago, William Schneider Jr. arrived at the Caps Media Center with an absolute treasure trove of Ventura history. Bill's father, William Schneider Sr., was a highly respected teacher throughout Ventura. For years, his hobby was recording on camera interviews and family histories with fascinating people all over the county. Recently, his son, Bill Jr., gathered together more than 100 tapes from his father's archives and working here at the Caps Media Center has painstakingly restored these treasures. Bill's new series, called My Father's Stories, explores some of the very early days of Ventura County. Most of the videos were recorded 20 to 30 years ago. The people, places, and stories Bill shares are part of Ventura's rich history. Welcome to My Father's Stories. These are there's story after story after story. You've done an amazing job with this, and uh, we're all enriched because of it. So, who have we got today? Today, we'd like to talk about uh, Carmelita Lorenza de Flores. Uh, Carmelita's ancestors arrived in Santa Barbara area in 1781, and her uh, her ancestors were actually guards for the mission and they were lance soldiers that is they had a very long lance and they they protected the mission uh, from adversaries they like uh, her grandfather came here as an orphan at the turn of the century and an archbishop from Spain uh, founded an orphanage and he named that orphanage La Lor Lor Zania. Lor Zania. so every orphan who went through that orphanage was named Lorazania, and that's how she got the name Lorazania from her father. They, uh, she had, at the age of 17, he left the or orphanage and moved to Santa Barbara and signed up to be a soldier at the Presidio at the, at, the, uh, at the mission, and he too was a lance soldier. He eventually got married and raised cattle on a small ranch in Montecito, and today that ranch is the polo grounds in Santa Barbara. Amazing. These stories just keep going. Let's see it. Okay. One of our guest's earliest known ancestors arrived in Santa Barbara 180 years ago during the Mission Era, when Father Sarah, or just after Father Sierra was here. And I'd like you to know Carmelita Lorenzana de Flores. How did I do that time? You did fine. You Thank did you. Fine. I'd like you to tell us about this. Well, my husband retired from work and He's always been very good with his hands, so he decided to take his camera and go up to City Hall and take the picture that was, that is in front of the City Hall as of now. He took angle pictures of it, and he took it home and started in, and this was the final thing of it. And uh, now, now, is this just a hobby? It's just a hobby. He does it when he feels like doing it, and uh, it seems to be very good for him. That's neat. Keeps him out of trouble. And he's done some very good pieces. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I put that in the fair without him knowing it, and he got a blue ribbon on you it. You did? <laughs> That's great. Tell me, who was the first that you know of of your ancestors to arrive in Ventura? In Ventura, it goes much further than Lawrence Anna. It goes back to 1781. Oh. And uh, there was three names. There was a Ruiz, a Lugo, and a coda. A coda. There were soldiers in Ventura when Ventura Mission was founded. And you call these leather? Leather jackets leather soldiers. Leather jackets. In Spanish, they call them soldados de cuera. And that means they walked. That all, means they walked. All the way. Uh, although some had horses, and they were lance soldiers. They had lances. And they called them lancers, of course. Now, your grandfather, Felipe, can you tell us about Felipe? Well, it's recorded that Felipe came here as an orphan with about 18 other orphans around the turn of the century, as far as we know. It's recorded in Bancroft's History of California that a, an archbishop of Spain was sent to Mexico, and these foundlings uh, seem to have been children that someone neglected their duty 
like they should have. And they weren't ordinary street waifs the way we get it. So he founded this home called the Lauren Santa Orphanage. And consequently, everyone that came out of there was named Lorenzana. Yes. And uh, so that's how we got the Lorenzana name. What their true name is, we don't know. We've heard that the true names are in the archives of Sevilla. But uh, that's going to another long genealogy and, and, thing. And, and they arrived in Santa Barbara, I think. They arrived in Santa Barbara, and some were sent to Monterey and some to San Diego. And they're recorded now in the genealogy books all up and down California. There's a lot of Lorenzanas that come from the same original orphans. And what family raised your great, this is your great grandfather? This is my great grandfather. What? He was raised in the Carrillo family in Santa Barbara, and at the age of about 17, he joined the soldiers at the Presidio in Santa Barbara, army. yeah, in the Army. There was a lot for them to do in those days. A lot for them to do. <laughs> and he served his country, and then he was married. Then he married. And what did he do? To, to our knowledge, he had cattle and land in Santa Barbara, and uh, according to the history of California, then they applied for these land grants that they got, but he was always just what they call a rancher and a vaquero. He's listed in the in the censuses, the earliest censuses of a vaquero, which means a man that works with horses. Ten, ten stock. Yes. Right? And he farmed. He ca uh, had cattle in the Montecito area. Yes, that's to our knowledge. He had cattle on the side hill of Montecito. Too bad he couldn't hang on to that. Well, <laughs> they were land rich and money poor. <laughs> All right. And then he came to Ventura County. And he formed a partnership. Can you tell us about that? Well, in, uh, when they were giving out the land grants, him and Raimundo Olivas applied for a land grant. And uh, they were turned down of one, which is now the Del Norte Ranch. And they were granted the Rancho San Miguel. The San Miguel Ranch. San Miguel Ranch, mm -hmm. which is now known as the marina and all that sort of thing. Now, th this we have a map on. And I'd like you to look at that, if you can, and maybe you can describe some of the boundaries, like the, the northwest boundary. That would be on your left side, the upper left corner. That is the San Juan, which is now, they call it in Ventura the San John Road, but it's San Juan, <laughs> and it means a big ditch. And that is where Pierpont, you turn down to Pierpont, and Pierpont Inn is right on the bluff, and it, that land grant goes all the way to the ocean and then back to the Santa Clara River and back to what we now call Thompson Boulevard. Now, Thompson would be on the upper part right. and our, our uh, spotlight is going along the beach, I believe, right? Right. right. It's and a triangular shaped piece of property. And that, uh, what we call Thompson Boulevard in that particular map is called, the, the in Spanish, the road to the Conejo, which evidently was the only road between Santa Barbara and Ventura to the Conejo. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then they sold this property. My grand great-grandfather sold his share of the property mm -hmm. to Dixie Thompson. Dixie Thompson. For $2,000 United States gold coin. That wouldn't even buy. <laughs> Can you imagine? Wow. Well, maybe at that time, $2,000 gold coin was a lot of money, but he that was land rich and money poor yeah. due to the terrible drought that they had. Yeah. It, was a different, uh, it was a different life then. Now, the Olivas name still remains down there. Still remains on the right side. There's a, there's a road that runs down there. there. There's that middle road, they call it, uh, where the Olivas Park is, and the Olivas Adobe still mm -hmm. stands there. Right. And to our knowledge, uh, Felipe Lorenzana never lived on the grant. Uh, we have never been able to determine whether he did or not. Now, did Ramundo Olivas build that? He didn't. He built the, the two-story adobe, but he lived with his family at one time on the small little edifice that's on that oh, land now. I see. You, you know, you told me an interesting story. When the ranchers received property, there was a ritual. Yes, I didn't know this until I read these land grants. People just thought that they just moved in and that was their property. But according to what I've read now, they had the priest, they blessed the land, and each one picked up the dirt and a twig or something, and it was blessed. And in the name of God, it was granted to them. 
it was a very formal it was a very formal thing and these are things that are coming out in California history now that yeah. people took for granted you know so a lot of nice history is coming out yeah. now there was a grandfather grandfather uh, Fortoso? Fortoso Fortoso can you tell us a little bit about grandfather Fortoso well he was the youngest one of all these children as far as we know and uh, he married Anayala which is also a very old name and he had a uh, they called them homesteads, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, around where the Del Mar, Limonaria would be now. They called it Los Olivos at that time. Well, it sounds like olive lands. Olive lands, olive for lands. olive lands. Oh. And there was a school there now, I guess. Yes. Anyway, from what we have written, he died, and he lacked the, his widow lacked the $5 to keep it. Mm -hmm. So she lost it. She lost it. <laughs> and she moved back into Ventura. And... Uh, so consequently, my father had to go to work as a very, very young man. Then there was a step-grandfather. My mother had a step-grandfather that came to California, I would say, when the railroad came in. That would be about in the middle 80, 1880s. About to, in towards that time, mm -hmm. and evidently from what he told us, he was from Chihuahua, and there was an awful lot of uprisings at that time. And it, they were caught between the devil and the hard rock, yeah. the Yaquis or the, yeah. the Federals. And uh, so he came with another man, and he never returned. He was a very wise person and told us a lot of stories and t taught my mother and my older brothers a lot of things about herbs and different things. And he worked for the Faria Ranch on the coast for many, many years. Uh, uh, I know where that is. Mm -hmm. uh, Virginia Baptiste right. lives there, I think. And he was a very knowledgeable person in his own way. He couldn't read and write, but uh, he planted by the signs of the moon and things like that. But he is a very happy man, very, didn't seem to lack for anything. He was, uh, I think, digging a hole up there or something. Well, the you story that we that heard, story? Uh, how true it is, I don't know, but my cousin that's much, much older than I was said that he told him that he was digging a hole up there where he lived, which is now by the railroad track, and he found a body that still had leather, and uh, the way he described it was one of these leather jacket soldiers. And being a fearful man of the law, he covered it up. But I think now there might have been a lot of history behind that if he hadn't have done that. But he was afraid, so he covered it. But he told about it. Now this for your ranch, I don't think we mentioned that, but that's on the Rincon. That's there. on the Rincon. This side of the county line. Right, and now it's planted in flowers. They have flowers in there, and a lot of beautiful cottages along right. the beach. Now your father. And my father was Felipe, and as I said, his father died when he was just a, my father was Pompilo, Felipe's grandson, yeah. and uh, he had to go to work very young, which is now, they call it Rancho del Norte, and it was a Chap Pietra ranch. If anybody remembers the early Ventura, the home was the old Farrell home on Santa Clara Street. And my dad worked for that family, and we found out afterwards the reason he went to work as a cowboy so young is that his uncle was the foreman for the, which is now the Rancho del Norte. Now this, this property that you're talking about, where your father worked, would be west of South Mountain. And it would, part of the Satakoy Country Club right, would right. be in there. And the, um, where they raise turf, uh, grass. Right in through that area. All through there. That's, mm -hmm. I understand that that's where it all was. Right. And uh, much of that lemon land was part of that old that's ranch. That's right. That's right. And you say he was a vaquero. He sure was. He worked for Hobson, I guess, since he was old enough to be able to ride a horse and uh, worked for Hobson for many, many years. And uh, Well, we have a picture of that. In fact, we have two pictures there. We show... Uh, there are many, uh, he's in, he's on the second white, second there it white is, horse, second white yes. horse, yeah. Uh, the story goes, I don't remember too much about that era, but the story goes that he was a very, very good cow hand, like all the men of that era were. Yeah. They did it for work, not for show like a lot of the boys right. do now, not, right. not taking right. anything away from the local boys that are yeah. good. Uh, this this feed lot and that's I guess what that was is was in El Rio. Is was that right? in El Rio mm -hmm. about the corner of uh, I think we determined it was Rice Road and 
Well, it could be around Central Avenue, Central Avenue. and Vineyard, if Vineyard. I remember correctly. And uh, some of those eucalyptus trees are still there, and that was quite a large, they call them feeder pens. Mm -hmm. that, they'd bring their cattle in off their range. Right, and, and to fatten them. Fatten them up in there. Then they'd bring them down to the Dixie Thompson Ranch, as we called it. Yeah. <laughs> did he ever have any close calls? I mean, cowboys in those days. He sure did, because did the story, uh, he was crippled when I remember, the, my first remembrance, and he was on horseback and he'd come home for lunch. And in those days, the cars didn't have any uh, crash type glass like they have now, it was just plain Shattered. ordinary glass. Shattered. And yeah. it backfired or something, the horse threw him and he got cut across here and broke his leg. And uh, then he was going to, they were taking cattle on horse, on a, in the train you know, down south of Palos mm -hmm. Verdes wherever Paulus Verdes was. Do you know where Paulus Verdes was? It's down in the desert country right. down below, Imperial and, Valley, I and think. And the train tilted or something, and he fell off, and he had his leg badly broken at that time. So he had a lot of close calls. Well, you mentioned once that he, uh, when he was had a shot. Somebody oh. fired a shot or... <laughs> this, is, this is a story of the family that uh, when we were children, my dad had a bullet wound through here. We didn't know what a bullet wound was. He had a hole, and we enjoyed looking at it. <laughs> and we found out that uh, his brother was very handsome and quite the man about town. <laughs> and my father was going into, they call them saloons in those days, and he went to light a cigar and raise his arm. Just as he raised his arm, somebody took a shot at him. But it was the husband thinking it was, it was my your, your dad. Uncle. It was my <laughs> uncle that they were after. So You told the story um, about a ride to El Rio that he made. Well, this, yeah, this goes on the, in, the ghost, in the ghost story type things. All right. we'll and see. my dad told the story that he, was, he had to go to El Rio to this particular place where the yards are. And he was riding, and of course, the old story about a horse being afraid of a cemetery. And he was going along, and he knew somebody was behind him because he could hear the hoofbeats. And every time he'd stop the horse, the hoofbeats would stop. And he, he just knew somebody was riding behind him. Finally, he got enough nerve to look around. Well, his, they wore like navy scarves in those days, and they wrapped them around, the, around their neck several times so they could bring them up for dust, not to hold people up, but to cover the dust. And uh, it had gotten loose, and those navy scarves were quite large, and it was flapping behind him, and that's what it was. It was snapping, and, and he it thought was it was snapping. a horse. He thought it was a horse, and that was as far as his ghost was. <laughs> that's good. You know, I can remember when I was a kid, I played uh, softball against a boy named Joe Lorenzana. Do you know Joe? Yes, he's the brother younger than I am. Now, were there any other ball players in your family? There was a lot of ball players, but there's an incident about ball playing that came up in 1915 that I read about and didn't realize it was my father. It was in a book. The Giants were in Oxnard. Yeah, the, you mean the New York Giants? The New York Giants. It was an exhibition on the 4th of July. And Fred Snodgrass, as everyone knows about, and somebody, they were all talking, and Abe Hobson, who was my dad's boss, uh, said that he had a rider that could rein a horse around the three bases as fast as any man could run, and that the shortstop was Hans Lobart. And he was supposed to be quite fast like shortstops were in those days. So my father went from Ventura to Oxnard and raced that horse around those three bases faster than Hans Lobart. But in the story, Hans Lobart says that the horse nudged him off the bases. But uh, from people that were there said, my dad did a beautiful job of reining, which is very difficult if you've seen a, the diamonds. Well, that's neat. You know, you said you had ghost stories. There <laughs> weren't any television in those days, but that was one of the recreations, wasn't it, uh, of the family to oh, tell well, stories. Well, uh, you call it recreation. I think they believed it. All right. I think they really believed it. Certainly. <laughs> That's how they were continued and passed on to from uh, you know generation to generation. We have a few topics here, and one would be the Wailing Lady. Can you tell us the story about the Wailing Lady? Well, the Wailing Lady, in Spanish, is called La Llorona, which means the Wailing Lady. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems like in Cortez's time or somewhere, the story changes all the time. But this particular story is when they killed her children and threw them in the water. She just would wail along all the rivers looking for her children. And oh, she was seen here in Ventura, believe it or not. 
And then I got, two years ago, I got a notice from my nephew off the newspaper that she had been sighted in Albuquerque. On the bottom, he says, boy, this old lady sure gets around, doesn't she? So that's, 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 a, that's a story that... A story of uh, And the people that have heard her, well, they, they know that it was the wailing lady. Now, Aunt Josephine, Aunt Josie? My Aunt Josie. Road this was going by wagon. She was going by a wagon, and they fixed them, I guess, like the old stage coaches or wherever they fixed them. And they used to go through a pass. And the only thing we can determine, it was going to Santa Maria, was it? Okay. And uh, she and my uncle, this stagecoach would be coming by with the bells ringing and the horses and the harness, and it would go right by them. Funny part of it is the wagon they were on was just room for them, but the stagecoach went they by went them, past. and they knew it was. And I says, did you see it? No, they didn't see it, but they heard it. They heard it. So it actually happened. <laughs> and there were treasure hunts. You told about a, uh, a man, I think, that was a jailer or a deputy sheriff here. Yes, that was C.J. Salcedo. Uh, mm -hmm. There was an era there where people what happened, I don't know, but everyone began to get treasure happy about finding treasures that belonged to, supposedly to the old Spanish people. And Mr. Salcedo went with another man up towards the Red Mountain, as we called it, and he didn't come back. And I think a month later, they found him and the other man they'd gotten over the ravine in the Red Mountain. They had an old Model A car, but uh, they didn't find the treasure. There's, Sorry to say. There's kind of a jinx on that mountain. Yeah, there, there seems to be. A, mm -hmm. I, from what I've heard, that wasn't the first time that had happened, but this treasure bit now began to get pretty hot and heavy there for a long time. Now, there are some, some tales, uh, I'd, I'd say they're old wives' tales, but there is one uh, that you told about the night your father died. Oh, yes, of course. My Aunt Josie was taking care of us. That was 1928, and we lived on Figueroa Street. And my dad was very ill at the old sister's hospital on Poli Street. And the phone rang about 10.30, and it was my mother notifying my aunt that my father had passed away. My older brothers and sister were at the hospital, and us younger ones were with my aunt. So my aunt says, well, I knew that he had because that um, screech owl, screech owl had gone by. And it, it always hit the window. So she knew that she my knew. she knew that my father had died. And there was no doubt about it, and we believed it because if you don't believe your mother and aunt, who are you going to believe? Who are you going to believe? <laughs> right. <laughs> there was one about a baby scratching themselves. Oh, do I have to tell that oh, one about myself? This is here. I am, 18 years old, <laughs> and I have my oldest boy, <laughs> and he's a little baby, and they have fine fingernails, you know, and mm -hmm. babies scratch their yeah. faces. And my son, my husband, came home, and he said. Gee, he's scratching, so why haven't you trimmed his nails? Well, I says, I can't. My mother says, I can't, <laughs> because if I don't cut him under a fig tree, he'll go crazy or blind, and I didn't want my son to get blind. You had to trim the nails under a fig sure. tree. Sure. So my husband got the cuticle scissors and cut his nails, and my son's 46 years old. And doing well. And he's not blind. He's very But old. I believed it. All right. <laughs> you know, we've talked. Uh, we've talked, you and I have talked about uh, times long ago before penicillin, and they used herbs in those days they and sure had did. special remedies. There was one about eucalyptus that I enjoyed. Well, my dad used to get the young little eucalyptus leaves and uh, seep them in hot, you know, boiling water, mm -hmm. and it's potent, very potent. And if you had a congestion in the nose, they put a towel over your head and and you uh, absorbed those things into your nostrils and it cleared them up. Or else he'd get a feather from a chicken and swab our throats with it. It wasn't a very happy time, but we never, I'm still here, You're so still it didn't here. hurt me. Now, th did, you, did you tell about going around the house with one of these with a whole string of eucalyptus? No, I said that they said that if you got a bunch of eucalyptus and put under your beds, the fleas didn't like them. The fleas wouldn't come in, <laughs> all right. Now, how about... Believe it or not, that's true. I believe it. If you tell me, Carmelita, I believe it. <laughs> if I can't believe you, who am I going to believe? That's right. What about squaw tea? Well, squaw tea is... Um, it looks like matchsticks, and uh, this, it's known as squaw tea here in this area. It's got another name, and right now I couldn't tell you, but uh, 
it's a remedy that's used for everything, and uh, the Spanish people used it for the kidneys and everything else. And as a matter of fact, I have used it. Mm -hmm. it uh, this is one of the many remedies that I think a lot of people are going back to a lot of these things. Uh, I took 60 youngsters, or was with some adults, that took 60 youngsters up to Mesa, that's around Matillaha. And uh, the guides there told these youngsters all about these herbs that they could find in the, uh, in the chaparral. But tell us about garlic. Well, garlic, as you know, even keeps the vampires away. <laughs> I, you I, knew that. I knew that, too. Okay. But garlic is, uh, is old, and garlic is beginning to come into its own now. But my dad carried it in the saddlebags all the time for rattlesnake bites for the, on, with the dogs or the cattle. And my aunt swears that if you kept it in your mouth, you wouldn't have high blood pressure, you wouldn't catch anything. Well, you wouldn't have any friends either. You, but you. <laughs> 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 but uh, garlic is, I believe, a, a very good remedy. And uh, people, as I say, are going back to garlic a lot. What about elderberry? Elderberry, now, good, could... old, good old flu, you know. They call it the grip. You ached all over. You just ached. So they'd get elderberry uh, leaves or the little yellow flower, and they'd seep that until it was piping hot and make you drink it. And believe me, you talk about humidity now, you just perspired, and that's all there was to it, and you got well. Now, nobody it does that you. anymore. It cured you. It cured us. Carmelita, tell us where you were born. I was born on Figueroa Street. In Ventura. In Ventura, two, three blocks away from the old mission, and I lived there till I got married. You're right down in uh, Nick Perano's area. Nick Perano's area, and that's a store we used to shop as little kids with Nicky's dad. And uh, to us, it was the only store in Ventura as far as we were concerned. That's quite a place. You know, we have a, and I'm going to let you tell us about this, and I'll hold it up. But this came from the great city of Los Angeles. Well, uh, Los Angeles is, is uh, celebrating their bicentennial, 1781 to 1881, and I happen to be descendant to this Jose Banegas, who was the first mayor of Los Angeles. So they had me go to Los Angeles and receive this certificate that we are descendant to the first settlers of Los Angeles. And Ventura's having their bicentennial this coming time. I don't know what they intend to do, but I'm very proud of this. And uh, they gave us also a certificate that I am descended to two of the soldiers that escorted the uh, founders from San Gabriel to Los Angeles. And one of them is Vicente Feliz and Roque Cota. And Feliz Boulevard in Los Angeles is named after this man. I think everybody down there calls it, what is it? Uh, Los Feliz. Lo, lo, yeah, Los, Los Feliz Boulevard. Los Feliz Boulevard. I've been on that street. Well, that's neat. How many family names? Well, I belong to Los Californianos, so I've had an opportunity to uh, do a lot of genealogy on my family names. Uh, I'm going to give you 30 seconds now. Well, I've I know got you have a lot 26 of 26 names. 26? 26 names. Spanish names. Can you, can you go right through them? Okay, Lawrence, Anna, Ayala, Venegas, Lopez, That's Ortega, Moraga, Lugo, Ruiz. How many more do you want? That's fine. <laughs> you know, Carmelita, that means a lot of Christmas cards if you sent Christmas cards, wouldn't it? That sure would, but I have enough family of my own to worry about to without worry sending, about. worrying about my relations. I come from a large family. We've been visiting with Carmelita Flores. And I, uh, it's always fascinating to me when we have people whose ancestors go back 180 and 200 years. And we've enjoyed having you. And I wondered if you might come back sometime and talk about your mother's side. Would you be interested in doing that? I would if I could find it. Uh, there's a lost. There's a lot of little fables of California that sometimes you can't find any ancestors. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. You're so welcome. We'll I enjoyed you. it. Thank you.